次Who's covered in sin? I see come my tears. It's a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. She is There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever is. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who comes when comes? Who speaks? Sally, 
my savior there is power in your name you're my There is no one like you. Save your king for us, King alone in death, in from the cross to a to great heroes to love, heroes to Christ is Thank <laughs> you. 
my morning grew quiet, my fleet wings to dance. When death was a guest, even my life began. I
Christ the Lord is risen today. Amen. Lips and all the glorious When we take this You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to you on this Easter morning. I am so glad to see all of you here worshiping with us this morning. Did you have breakfast and was it wonderful? Yes. Thank you, thank you to those who worked so hard on making that breakfast for us. We are so thankful here at Calvin Church to have a crew of people that are willing to spend time to do that and to treat us all. Uh, a couple other announcements for us this morning before we proceed with the rest of our Easter worship. Sign-ups for life groups will be next week. If you are willing to lead a life group, would you please see Pastor Mark, Pastor Brian, or any of the other staff members, Vicki in the office, you can call her. If you have an idea for a life group, for those of you that don't know, life groups are uh, a six-week, usually a six-week event, and uh, we get together and we learn about really neat things. Sometimes it's as cool as learning about um, space. Uh, we learned about recycling one time. We learned about, learned. I know there was a group that learned how to make bread, right, Barb? Yes. And so there's been some great life groups. And so if you have an idea for something that could be a six-week thing for a life group, please see one of the staff members. Also, elder and deacon nominations are in your bulletin. Uh, also, you can write a nomination over at the visitor center and in the office. Uh, that will happen. So let's see if there's anything else. Oh, we have some people to welcome this morning. We have a couple couples that are transferring and joining Calvin Church, and if they would stand, I'd love that. The Spoolstras, Frank, Frank and Beth Spoolstra. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Taylor and Elise Johnson.
And Taylor and Elise, I heard that you're jumping right in that you were at the food truck on Friday. Yes. So we welcome you and thank you for taking part and being coming a part of Calvin Church. So I welcome you this morning and I welcome you with these words. <clears throat> this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And here's your part. Let's do that again. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We get. Would you stand and greet each other with those words, Christ is risen? Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us worship our risen Savior. Invite the praise team forward for worship this morning. From pole to pole, twelve faces, Christ draws away. Redeemer, for we have done for me. No prince to share with me, all the eternity. Just on the feet of him who brings good news, good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness, our God reigns, our God reigns. Oh, God, rain. Oh, God, rain. Oh, God, rain. 
Out of the two, miracles and majesty, He is alive. He is alive. God loves us so. See here, His hands, His feet aside. Yes, we know He is alive. Our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God Amen, you may be seated. I'd like to invite the children forward. Any kids? got a special message good morning come on up all right so let's start with an easy question what day is it today Easter, and what do we celebrate on Easter? Jesus, well, Christmas, we sort of celebrate Jesus' birthday. On Easter, we celebrate something even more important, that he rose again from the dead. And I'm gonna show you a couple Easter symbols now the first two are a little bit sad because they have to do with what Jesus did for us. What is this? What's that? It's a nail. And when Jesus died on the cross for us, he had nails in his hands and feet to keep them up on the cross. And do you think that probably hurt a lot? Yeah. So the thing to remember is Jesus chose to die for us on the cross. He chose to make that sacrifice. When the Roman soldiers came to take him away, um, some of his followers, Peter drew a sword and was all ready to fight him off. Um, and Jesus said, no, you know, we're gonna, he chose to do this so that he could die for our sins. Does it, now here's a trickier question. Why is the sponge part of the Easter story? Let's see, do you know? He did have nails in his hands, but what does the sponge have to do? Does anyone know? Do you know? Oh, you're thinking, oh yeah, no. Um, so I wasn't using the sponge as his hands. I see what you're thinking. Um, no, later on, while he was on the cross, one of the Roman soldiers felt sorry for him and offered him a sponge dipped in like medicinal wine and stuff to sort of dull the pain because they knew that it hurt. And so in order to get to the happy part of Easter, which is today, we need to remember what Jesus did for us, that he chose to go through this pain and die on the cross for us. All right, I've got one more, and I think you'll all get this one. First of all, what is this? Mr. Bowtie, I love your bow tie. What is it? It's an egg. Now, does this egg have anything inside it? No, it's empty. And when Jesus was buried, um, they buried him in a big stone tomb. So he wasn't underground. He was sort of in a natural stone cave and they rolled a big stone in front of the cave. And when they came, they couldn't go visit him the next day because it was the Jewish Sabbath. When they came on the third day, the stone was rolled away and was Jesus' body in the cave? Yeah. No, it was empty. So one of the reasons we celebrate 
Easter with an Easter egg. I know there's a lot of talk about the Easter bunny and eggs do symbolize life because a baby chick comes from an egg, right? But you as Christians remember that the empty egg also symbolizes the empty tomb, right? So our Bible verse for today is Mark 6, 16. So when they came to the grave and they saw the stone rolled away, there was an angel. And the angel said, don't be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. <clears throat> he is risen. He is not here. Okay, so I want you to see if you can say part of that with me. So it's Jesus of Nazareth. Can you say that with me? Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. And so whenever you hear people talk about Easter eggs and Easter egg hunts, I want you to also remember that that's part of our message as Christians of the empty tomb. Yes. So you got to have an Easter egg hunt. That's great. Oh, some of the eggs were empty. Maybe they were trying to remind you about the true meaning of Easter. OK. Um, you can come on up and take one from each bag. There's an Easter bunny and an Easter Kit Kat. Oh, did you get two of the same? Sorry, get one from there. There you go. Grab one. Thank you, Lucille. We're now going to transition to a time of offering. This is where we can have the opportunity to give back um, our gifts back to God as an act of worship. I'd like to invite those deacons forward. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have given immeasurable grace to each one of us. This morning, we give you glory, we give you praise, and we give you thanks. Please bless these tithes and offerings. We pray they can be used so others can experience the joy we are feeling this Easter morning. Our special offering today is for Resonant Global Missions. We are thankful that we can work together with this organization to share the good news, not only in our community, but around the world. We pray your spirit is followed as Resonant uses these gifts to proclaim the gospel and build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, he let forbid, yeah, and he 
To buy my palm holding an empty grave is there to prove my savior because he lives I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, he is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth. The living just because he lives. I'll cross that river. I'll fight my I'll see the and I'll see I can face to fall alone because he lives. All fear is gone. I come alone. He holds the future. Is worth the living just because he lives. It's worth the living just because he lives. Amen. All right. At this time, uh, we have a special video. Um, throughout Lent, we've been um, showing videos of people's personal encounters with, with God. Um, and this one is from Karen Swords. My story started out about 20 years ago, and it's still going. Um, I worked and loved my work. Absolutely loved it. Friends took mental health days. My mental health was the days I was working. I always enjoyed my employment. And one day a lady came and we were chatting, one of the, the patients, and she said, Karen, you would really enjoy something called BSF. I said, I know all about BSF, but I'm here, I'm working. I can't do BSF. And she said, you would love it. I'm going to pray about it. And I said, please don't, because God answers all my prayers. I don't, I don't need that right now. It'll happen. I'll be in BSF when I'm retired. About two, three weeks later, the new owner of the business took me aside and said, Karen, I want to tell you privately how much I appreciate you in my coming into this office, you're the only one who was ready to adapt to my new ideas. He said, you have been such a joy and comfort to me, and I just wanted you to know it. And he left. He didn't own the business yet, but he was buying the business. Fast forward a couple weeks, the current owner took me into the office and said, I don't even know how to do this, 
but you know we're overstaffed and it's been decided that you will be leaving the office. Okay. Um, okay. And he hugged me and he, he kissed my cheek and he had all my paperwork, diplomas and things over 20 years of employment. And I went out and he said, I hate to do this, but I need to ask for your key. Of course you do. And I gave him my key and got in my car and thought, hmm, I don't have to go to work tomorrow. I was stunned. I was shocked. And just so many things in my brain. All of a sudden, I don't have a job. And I had to drive over the causeway to get home. And on the causeway, I said, God, what's all this about? And I honestly heard his voice in my head. It sounded like my ears. I felt his presence. I felt him wrapping his arms around me. And he said, Karen, don't worry about this. I've got it. It's part of my plan. I got plans for you, and it didn't involve employment. And here we go. And I'm thinking, OK, my husband was just disabled. I'm the only one working. Um, OK, you got this. Show me the way. Got home, got into the house, and said, I just lost my job. <laughs> uh, it was a financial nightmare for me, I thought. And God had that all worked out, too. Um, Kirby found a part-time job. We were OK. And about two weeks later, my mom took a terrible fall, and I became her caregiver. I was required to be at the hospital two days a week for this meeting thing. I thought, ah, I couldn't have done this. A couple weeks later, my daughter calls to tell me about a horrendous situation at her home down in Mississippi. Mom, I don't know what to do. This had happened. It was a horrible situation. Dad had left them. The kids were being teased at school. I said, if they're being bullied, if they're being teased, send them here. And I made arrangements for them to fly up. I had two little boys I had to homeschool for two months until the end of the school year. And here I am, a teacher. After that, my daughter came. And things kind of um, straightened out. Things um, settled in. She found her own place to live here. Everything was good. God did have everything planned out ahead of time. And I said, it's still going on because the feeling I had at that time, the overwhelming peace of being in his presence and hearing his words just to me are still with me. Every time there's a crisis, I, I go back to that feeling. I go back to that knowledge that he's right here. We just have to recognize it, believe in it, trust in it, depend on it, plan on it. It's been just such a blessing in my entire life. Thank you for sharing, Karen. Um, this month, uh, we have, uh, will you say these words for me with uh, the March verse of the month? We're in John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Thank you. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we came on Thursday evening and we contemplated darkness. The world was dark on that night, 
2,000 years ago. The cities of the Roman world were filled with slaves. More than half of the population were slaves. Your people, the Jews, had become corrupted. Their spiritual leaders were corrupted. They did not recognize you. And you personally, on that Monday, Thursday evening, faced incredible darkness. The weight of all of the sin through all of the millennia of the entire world was on your shoulders. That next day, the darkness increased. You faced a horrible death, a death we cannot even imagine. And the world, Israel at least, and perhaps the whole world, literally became dark, physically dark, for hours as you died. We thought about that. We considered the darkness in our world today. It has persisted through the centuries. We look at the world and we see darkness. We look at Russia and China, what's going on in Ukraine and the Middle East, Gaza. We look at Haiti. We look at the mess at our own southern border. We look at our cities and we see darkness. And even though you have redeemed us, a darkness still lurks in each of our lives. The Apostle Paul called it the flesh, the old man. But there is darkness in our lives, even though we are redeemed and we walk in the light. And so we confess this morning that we, we sin every day. We say things, we do things we shouldn't. We leave undone things we should. We fall short of your glory. You have commanded us that we are to pray constantly without ceasing, and yet we would rather fiddle and play games on our smartphones or our devices than spend time with you. We confess that this morning and ask for forgiveness. It's a mystery to us why you did what you did on that Easter weekend. Paul wrote about the mystery of Christ that had been revealed through the gospel, but it's still a mystery to us why the King of Kings, the creator of all things, would take on flesh and do what you did. But this morning we come rejoicing because you conquered death. You rose from the dead. You're alive. And because of that, we're alive. For those that give ourselves to you and accept your free gift, you have given eternal life. The sting of death is gone. And all we can do is say thank you. We rejoice in that. Lord Jesus, on that Easter morning, you were changed. Mary did not recognize you in the garden. The couple on the road to Emmaus that Easter afternoon did not recognize you. The disciples had trouble recognizing you. You were changed, but you were changed even more when you went, went to heaven. And we think of the words of John in his revelation, how he saw you standing there in a snow white robe with a golden sash around your chest, your eyes burning like fire, your face as bright as the sun and your head crowned with many crowns, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we look forward to standing 
before you in snow white robes matching your own though our sins were as scarlet they will be as white as snow they will be taken away from us as far as the east is from the west Lord Jesus you told us that you were coming back soon Lord it's been 2,000 years we need you our world needs you and so I close this prayer with John's words with which he closed the New Testament come quickly Lord Jesus come soon in your name amen thank you Paul and all of those helping lead worship on this Easter morning as we turn to a time in God's Word where we're not going to be talking about Jesus' resurrection, but a resurrection right before that, which I think only points to the powerful resurrection of Christ. There was once a terrible fire at night, and a boy, a young boy, was trapped inside that fire, and he had to go to his rooftop, and down on the ground, his father yelled up to him. He said, son, I can see you jump down to my arms, but the son was terrified, for all he could see was smoke and fire and he couldn't see his father at all and the father called again he said son jump down I can catch you and the, the boy said dad I can't see you and the father replied but I can see you and that's all that matters faith comes with risk and that is a simple yet clear story of faith taking a leap taking a jump of trust knowing that God will have us. God will catch us. Living a life of faith means we sometimes step out into that kind of risk. Hudson Taylor was a renowned missionary who started China Inland Missions and uh, faced extraordinary things against him. And he once said, unless there is an element of risk in our exploits for God, there is no need for faith. Jesus took risks in his faith as well. And today's story from John 11, you can have that open in your, in your Bibles if you have one, 17 through 44. I'm going to kind of bounce around with some of those passages. But we can't go directly into it without kind of setting the scene first. Just like when you're watching your favorite show, you know, when it comes on and it says previously on Chicago Fire, right? Previously on Grey's Anatomy, which why that show is still on television is beyond me. Okay, but they give you a recap. They catch you up to where you're at. We need to know where we're at in the story. It's a story about Jesus and a family that he is very dearly, closely connected to. Uh, Lazarus and her sisters, Martha and Mary. And Lazarus has fallen very, very ill. And even at the point when we pick up our story, he is now dead. So the sisters go out to seek Jesus and bring him to Bethany, which is very close to Jerusalem. And upon hearing this, Jesus is moved. He wants to go to this family. He wants to go to Lazarus because he's compelled by his compassion. Yet his disciples fear this because the opposition against Jesus is mounting and mounting and mounting. And the Jewish authorities are now to a point where they're willing to get Jesus by any means necessary. They want to take him out and they fear Jesus going to towards Jerusalem during this especially busy time of Passover could be fatal for him, which in hindsight it is fatal for him. But Jesus knows this and he takes the risk. He jumps off the roof, right? He's insistent that he will go to this beloved family who's called to him. He takes great lit risks of faith. So that's where we pick up our story, at the, and we're going to read the 17th through 20 verse, 21st, 27th verse, 17 through 27 here. Um, this is how the story goes. Now, when Jesus came to Bethany, he, he, he heard Mary and Martha, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles. That's significant, okay? And Mary and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but, but Mary remained seated in the house. 
Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When Jesus arrives, the full procession of Jewish mourning was in process. Families who knew this family would come to their home. They would wail openly outside of the house. It was a community event, and there was lots of people there. And upon seeing Jesus approach, Martha runs to him, I imagine. I imagine she just fell into his arms in exhaustion and grief. And I imagine Jesus embraced her in empathy and compassion and in love. And she says this remarkable statement, kind of a dual statement. Jesus, if only you would have been here earlier, my brother would not be dead. It's a statement of doubt followed by a statement of faith. But I know you, and I know God will give you anything you ask, right? Martha is one of those characters that we need to understand the perspective of where she's at. This is a story of perspective, of understanding what she sees on her plane of existence. If you remember, in Luke 10, Martha and her sister Mary are, are with Jesus, and Mary spends her time falling to Jesus' feet, worshiping Jesus, anointing him. And Martha, if you remember, is busying about the house, making sure things are right and preparing. She completely misses the opportunity to worship at the feet of Christ, right? And she is like so many of us humans. She loses perspective and thinks this God thing, is this religious thing, is about us doing and proving and working, when in reality it comes down to offering ourselves, submitting, falling before the presence of Christ. It's a story of perspective. So imagine you're flying into um, JFK Airport, New York City, right? And as you're flying in, you look down and you see a traffic jam backed up for, for miles, right? Cars and cars and cars. But you can see the, 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 where the traffic jam has started. And you can see they're clearing the accident. The emergency vehicles are cleaning it up. And when you land and you get in your car, you see all these people standing outside their cars. They're looking. They're honking. They have no idea what the man just saw. You see that perspective? You see Martha and Mary, for that matter, and us, for that matter, are stuck in the traffic jam. We're unable to see uh, the bigger picture that this is going to be solved. This isn't as big a deal as we think. It's going to clear up. They're, they're caught in the trees, unable to see the forest, unable to see the divine perspective of what Jesus is really after. They're stuck there. The reality, the traffic jam reality, is that Lazarus is dead. It's a stone cold hard fact. Death is it. Death has affected, I think, everyone in this room in some way. All of us will face death. It's a reality. The facts are the facts. And she's not able to see past that. And we cannot blame her. We cannot blame her, for I fear we would be no different. Here's the thing with this story and so many stories we approach in the Bible, in the New Testament, and especially in the Gospels. We know what Jesus is going to do here, right? We know that he's going to call Lazarus out from that tomb and he's going to rise again. We know that in a few short days, Jesus is going to be killed and rise again. We know that, but enter the perspective of not knowing that a moment. Set aside the fact that it's Easter today and think about what Martha must have been like with that stone-cold reality of her dead brother. Set aside the fact that it's these women, these very women, that will discover Jesus risen at the tomb very, very shortly. Right? I believe we miss something when we don't allow ourselves to enter that perspective of the first audience of what this must have felt like 
look like when Jesus says things like he will rise again in Mary's plain response, right? Your brother will rise again, and Mary answers in her plane of reality, I know he will at the resurrection of the dead, a Jewish belief similar to ours that when Jesus comes back that he will raise our bodies and give us new flesh. Of course he will then, but she doesn't see the point that no, 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 he's going to rise again right now, right? One of the things I find absolutely remarkable about this story and so many others is Jesus doesn't just stay at his elevated divine status. He, em- he, emphas- he has empathy with the human perspective. He enters the human perspective fully, right? He enters their perspective. He incarnates himself deeply, fully into their situation. That word incarnate uh, is Latin for in flesh. He becomes in flesh with them. He joins Mary and Martha and all the others around them. He carries their pain. He sees the same cold brutality of death with them. I know that many of you, and some of you very, very recently, have grappled with loss of a loved one. And you know that feeling that Martha and Mary had, that gaping loss, that that coldness, right? Right? And I know you know you have hope in your faith that that death is not the end, but that does not negate the fact that it's still painful, very, very painful. And then listen to these words. Now the 33rd verse here, 33 and 30 to 35. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. The shortest verse of the Bible. Yet packed with incredible power. Jesus wept. Why would Jesus weep when he knows in just a few moments those tears of sorrow are going to be turned to tears of joy? Why would Jesus weep when he knows he's going to end this sin and pain business through his own death and his own resurrection? Therein lies the power of true love. That is his love. That's what we mean when God becomes flesh, incarnates. He fully chooses to enter our perspective and what we deal with. He takes it on, which means God makes himself, chooses himself to become fully one of us. He enters our story, our pain, and our brokenness. And I want you to know personally that when you are in pain, when you carry some shame within you, some insecurity, some brokenness, some sin, Jesus carries it with you. He weeps with us with us. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do that. He could stay up here above the traffic jam and scold us for saying, don't you see? But no, he says, okay, I'm going to look at it as you're seeing it. I'm going to enter it. Stepping back from this incredible act of Jesus' compassion, right? Back to verse 23, when Martha hears his words, Uh, Jesus responds with perhaps the most definitive and powerful of all his seven I am statements, okay? He says, Martha, listen, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. We know that Jesus is referring to to the events that will happen in just a moment. We know that Jesus is referring to the fact that he will defeat his own death, that he has the power over that death. And again, like with most of these statements, that's the primary lesson. Jesus is boldly claiming that through his death on a cross and his defeat of that death through the resurrection, which is what we celebrate today, that although we face death physically on this earth, It is not the end. We are eternally spared from death. It has no sting for us spiritually on this world. That he will cross over from our plane of perspective here and divinely interfere like this, like a cross. 
right? Like the cross. And that is how we are offered hope. Because Jesus has been resurrected, we spiritually have become new creations through nothing but faith in him. And that's what Easter is all about. Easter, the word means dawn or shine. It's the light of life, okay? Though death pains us here on this earth, we claim it eternally does not condemn us to its ending. That the sin will be paid for by the cross and the sin's penalty, which is dead, will, dead, will, death, will be overturned by the resurrection. There's the theology of Easter. Actually choosing to believe it and live into it is a whole lot harder than just claiming what we say we believe about it. But I'm drawn to the last part of the statement I think we overlook. Yes, he is the resurrection. He defeats death spiritually its condemnation has nothing on us if we have faith in Christ, but he's also the life. He's also the life and the life. Not only, Martha, will I defeat sin and eternal death, but I will also give you life here now on this earth. I will give you what you need to propel yourself through this life with this eternal vision of hope. Maybe you're like me, but I far too easily boldly claim um, that I believe in the resurrection. That I know that I am saved, not by my works, but by Christ's works. And that although my death will come on this earth, it is not the end, nor is it in the end for you. Without that resurrection, we would not eat breakfast this morning. Without that resurrection, that belief, Pastor Brian and I would have no right to get up here and claim this stuff. Without that, there's no reason to get together later with family and eat ham and celebrate and all that stuff. Our entire faith, the entire Christian narrative, hinges on Easter morning, right? But how often do I miss that he is my life now? He offers us all we need to make it through this life with abundance, with joy and perspective. Not always with what we call blessings, not always with what the world calls success, but an inward peace that will drive you through suffering. He is the resurrection and the life. When Jesus approaches the tomb of Lazarus and he looks in to see the reality, that, that is the center of the traffic jam, death. Four days, death, right? He sees, he sees what we see. He's on a highway and he sees the mess we are in, the mess that sin has become, the mess where bad things happen to good people, a world still filled with evil, a world still riddled and ripened with death. And in a moment, in an instant, he cries, he yells out, Lazarus, come out! And in a bolt of divine power, the divine plane that we can't even imagine what it looks like intersects our plane and life is breathed into that dead man. He is given breath in his lungs and he arises and he comes to life and all around see it. And all around we're elevated to see how God sees, to see that this God, death is nothing that this God can swipe it all away with nothing but his spoken word. I'll, I say this often, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most difficult thing for us to believe and even more difficult for us to live into daily. What would my life look like if I really grasped every breath as if death and evil is defeated and the life we live now is only a journey towards when he is coming back or calls us home, right? Then I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to think about this, that tomb of Christ or the tomb of Lazarus, either, o, either one. However you may picture what it looks like. Is there anything in it today? Nope. When I was able to go to Jerusalem years ago and I was able to go to the church, um, 
think it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they call it. And it's the place where they say uh, Jesus was crucified. And really, it's only about 100, 200 feet from the place they say he was buried. Now, is it the exact place? We don't know, but it's the area. But this place is venerated, and there's this little, little beautiful, golden, ornate, looks like a shed, okay? And there's a door about this high, and in it, they say, is the tomb. That is the tomb Christ was laid in it. And there's hordes of people waiting to go in. And there's, there's Coptic Christians and Catholic Christians and Protestant Christians and you name it Christians from all over the world. And they're going in here and they're weeping and they're wailing and they're crying and they're praying. And I kind of thought, I said, nothing's in here. <laughs> he ain't here anymore. This is done. But here's the thing maybe to think about. Are there things in your life today, in my life today, that you are leaving in the empty tomb? That you don't believe Jesus could call deeply into and say, come out, rise up. Today is a day of all days we should ask that. Things that we don't believe he could resurrect. And those things can look different for all of us. A doubt, a shame, the one sin, the one sin there's no way he could forgive in me. Your pride, my insecurity, they lie there like a dark cloud and I forget that Jesus could offer to raise them if only I cry out, as Martha did. Lord, I believe you are the Son of God. That's all we can do. I believe you're the Son of God. Sue asked me a great question yesterday. Sorry, Sue. In women's Bible study, they were talking and they said, Jesus told these people he was going to rise in three days' time. Right? He told them this. These people saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. Why were they not waiting at that tomb for him to come out? Why? The women came there to anoint him and were surprised to see that he was not there. But they weren't waiting. I don't know. But I know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hardest thing for us to practically believe in day by day by day by day. And I know that Jesus rose and he did not scold them he did not say, why weren't you here? Why weren't you here having a worship service on Saturday all night long until Sunday morning came? I told you I was going to rise again. No, he didn't. He joyfully embraced them. He found the disciples and walked through a wall and said, look at, look at my hands. It's me. I'm risen, right? Don't just believe in the resurrection on Easter morning. Believe it tomorrow morning. Believe it when suffering comes. Believe it every day, every breath, every moment. And whatever that thing that you might have left in that too, pray for God to raise it again, to breathe life into it again. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we readily sing the songs. Up from the grave you arose. I readily believe it in my head. I believe it even in my heart. Holy Spirit, I pray for each and every person in here that we can live lives of resurrection. We can live lives of hope that because you defeated death, we have hope in this world even when the world takes everything away from us. Help us live daily resurrected lives. It's in your name we ask. Amen. Stand and sing our final song. Christ alone, He is my life, my strength. 
Christ alone to God flesh, fullness of God in him, space, this gift of love, just this, scorn the words he came to say to mock, since Jesus died, the rest of me. Say this for the man we see. I Light of the world, my dog is saved. Then bursting forth, in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am he. And he is mine, what with the precious blood of Christ. Hail to love, your fear is death. This is the power of truth. He stick me from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus compares my destiny. No power of man, no scheme of man can ever walk from his home to the returns or calls me more. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. We hold your hands open as we share in God's blessing, my friends. Sin's curse has lost its grip on you. The grips of hell itself have nothing on you in the light of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Believe he is your life this day and the next. May the love of this God, the grace of his son Jesus Christ, and the peace of his spirit go with you and your own. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I live, I live, because he is risen. I live, I live, with the power over sin. I live, I live, because he is risen. I live, I live, to worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, because your love, because your love, because your love, above the day. I live because he is risen. I live out of the sea. I 
If I to the world Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because of you. Because of you. Because of you. What is?